in case uh, um, I didn't want to, uh, I wasn't even sure until really this last night, this morning, what we were going to do. Um, but so I didn't. That's why I didn't call you to bring to, to bring the sheets I handed out to you earlier this month that um, were um, questions. Uh, that was uh, how do you define family? And uh, so, in keeping with, um, it really, it's kind of in keeping with things we've already been talking about in some respects. Um, I thought that we would. Uh, go to the sheet and talk to one another about uh, what it addresses. And it definitely fits into um, things that are going on in our world right now, what with the, uh, the, uh, the decision that was just made uh, concerning um, homosexual marriage, um, uh, things that God is very clearly against in Scripture. There is no ambiguity. The Bible's not, the Bible's not, doesn't have a big, huge, fat gray area when it comes to do that. It's very strong on the topic. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important that we address it, amen? Mm -hmm. And we look at what Scripture has to say and allow our hearts to be... Uh, and, uh, and another big part of the reason why I gave these sheets out, I'm going to give them periodically. I'm not looking to make it a regular thing necessarily. I might, we might do it as much as once a month um, as far as me handing something like this out. I intend them to be more thought-provoking and things for you to own your own faith rather than just parrot what someone <laughs> like me says to you. You know what I mean? It's, it, if you don't own your faith, there's going to come a time when you're going to be confronted and they're not going to care what your pastor has said. You know what I'm saying? Right. You can't stand on my word. I'm not God. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can't even stand on what I said, you know, much less you. You know, if you don't know what your father, your heavenly father has said about these things, then, uh, then you're in a very, very precarious situation. Amen? It's true. And so, you know, we, we want to spend some time with that and, and know what the scriptures have to say. So let's go ahead and I'll read the article itself. Uh, um, and remember, I found this article. I already knew it would not be hard. Um, I, what popped in my heart was to, uh, to give a handout sheet that, that challenged us concerning our traditional understandings of family roles and so on. <clears throat> and um, so I just typed in, um, how do you define a family? Um, and... Uh, and pop, the first thing that came up was an article called How Do You Define the Family mm -hmm. by the New York Times. So you can already tell what direction it was going to go. It was going to be um, yeah. majorly liberal in every way, which wasn't surprising because Google, Google is extremely liberal. I know something about the search engine because I, I build websites and I know about SEO and, uh, and uh, um, they are very, very, very deliberately hardcore left, um, uh, Google is. Um, so uh, there, even if a search... Even if you have two sites that are optimal as far as just the basic criteria, if one of them leans to the left, that will get a higher ranking. Um, so, I mean, I already know that. So, uh, it's, that's, not, that's not by accident. That's on purpose. Right. So, uh, you need to understand that going in. So, uh, anyway, so I already knew the first thing that I pulled up would be garbage. So, it wasn't really a, it wasn't a, really, it wasn't a hard thing to do. It says, um, is your definition of a normal family a married mother and father? and their biological children living together under one roof? If not, what do you think a family is or can be? Do you think um, a new definition of family is starting to emerge in our society? If so, do you, th do you see that in your own life or community? If not, why not? What experiences do you have with alternative family structures in general? In a normal family, Lisa, uh, written by Lisa, Lisa Belkin, she writes about a new study that shows attitudes are changing. What is a family? Statistically, it is no longer a mother, a father, and their biological children living together under one roof, and certainly not with dad going off to work and mom staying at home. It's amazing that they draw real attention to, and certainly not, because we can't have any of that biblical stuff. Although perception and acceptance often lag behind reality, there is evidence that a new definition of family, of family while, while far from universally accepted, is emerging. A report this month by the Pew Research Center asked 2,691 random chosen adults whether seven trends were good, bad, or of no consequence to society. The trends were more unmarried couples raising children, more gay and lesbian couples raising children, more single um, women having children without a male partner um, to help raise them, more people living together without getting married, and more mothers of young children with, uh, working outside of the home. Tell us how you define family and why. 
Do you, um, do you think a new definition of family is starting to emerge in our society? If so, do you see that in your own life or community? These are some of the many answers that were given. I just grabbed the top whatever. I didn't screen any of them. I just grabbed it. I did have to correct grammar because it's astounding how people just don't know the English language anymore. <laughs> it's just crazy to me. Uh, the, the, they, they, they say sentences that just make no sense because it doesn't even have a subject. They just have a couple of nouns and, throw, and verbs thrown together with a period and no subject. You know? like, what did you just say? You know, It happens a lot. So you have to, you know, I had to finish a couple of sentences so it actually made sense. But um, Maria said, uh, and you see this is pretty current. This is uh, 2015. Family can be a really close friends that you know um, or that tell you everything, tell you, I'm sorry, or that you tell everything too. A new definition of family is evolving in our society. I see all, I see, I, I see all my really close friends as family. Um, Gandalf said, the word family means someone you can trust, someone that you can put before yourself. Sometimes you'd, those you'd be willing to take a bullet for. To do, uh, I do think that the definition of family has changed over the years. I think that it has become more socially acceptable to label and define those who you wouldn't be considered that 50 to 70 years ago, whether that be due to difference, a difference in race, gender, or age. Uh, Tori Z said, a family is a group of different people who love you and you love them too, like a mom and dad. They, um, they always take good care of you because, they, because they, they all love you. I think there is a new definition of family uh, is clearly starting to emerge in our society because my friends become one of my family members too. Um, Beverly says, the way I define family is thinking about how close we are. Because I think people who, are, who always make my heart feel warm is family. Also, those who treat me as a family member. Um, of course, they don't define what that would be like, but nonetheless. Um, in some cases, we have to spend more time at school, so our friends and our teachers at school are more like family members. It depends. If, um, it can mean those uh, who, we, who in our daily life we communicate with, others who are outside our natural families. Lynn says, a relationship as close friends, like my family, who can, uh, who can help me and solve problems and share their happiness. Matt says, family can be very close friends that you are not afraid to share personal things with or who you have a connection with. And of course, it just went on with thousands of others. Um, so I presented these questions to you, and so we'll just start with number one. Does this redefining a family work to destroy the reason why God created family in the first place? If so, how? Not everybody all at one time. Well, I wrote, it ends up destroying it because it begins by wanting to duplicate what man, to duplicate it man's way. Family, real families, are not necessarily easy. They take time, effort, and involvement, but they also take <coughs> Yes. The past. Mm -hmm. History. History. Mm -hmm. That binds them together. Mm -hmm. um, you can't. You can't really sidestep that, mm -hmm. because there is something that comes down through the lineage mm -hmm. that we we have lost here in America. We've gone our separate ways, and it's that core that that works for the betterment of the family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. world's way of family now. It's just friends and what you feel good and stuff like that. But there's no uh, <clears throat> deep con connection. Okay. I mean, it's more like feel good. I mean, if that's family, you know, when somebody does something, I mean, there's no, oh, I lost my train of thought. But um, it, it destroys, I mean, there is no con connection. Mm -hmm. permanent connection, mm -hmm. the way that <clears throat> society, it's the, the feel-good, whatever, uh, 
kind of scenario. I, I, if it's too much hassle with my real family, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go out and make my own people that will agree with me type mm -hmm. scenario, which is rampant right now. Well, that's for sure, yes. One yeah. thing it doesn't say is, like Kathy was saying, that it's a feel good, people I can talk to and understand and all that. Mm -hmm. Family involves people that don't get along, that are hard to live with, that are going on the wrong track, and, and mm -hmm. you stay with them, you, you love them throughout whatever they're doing and try, and, and try to pull them back and to, to believe in the Lord and, and to, to follow Him and to family. God instituted the family as His family. I don't know what I'm going to say next because I lost my train of thought too. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, just, it's not something you hang around with people and you draw them in because, like Kathy said, they agree with you. Mm -hmm. Families don't agree. Yeah. But yet you stick with them. Mm -hmm. you, you, you try to help them or they try to help you. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, on God's terms, mm -hmm. on what's morally right and and not saying, well, that's okay, you know, it's okay because that's what society does. Mm. You know? Yeah, one of the things it definitely is is a pressure release valve. Mm. It, it, people in today's world do not want anything to do with pressure. They want anything to do with, uh, with a challenge. They want everything to be as simple as possible. Um, I mean, it's, it's astounding to me um, how rampant that is in every area of our life. <clears throat> everything we want instant gratification and we don't want challenges we want people to agree with us um, and 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 when people disagree it is not taken from, uh, from a a calm um, dispassionate intelligent view it becomes at that point a need to either just walk away from them because you're trying to avoid conflict because you're an avoider or it becomes something where you you dig your feet in and you're going to be proven right regardless of what and it becomes a challenge rather than being to sit down and discuss something through with somebody intellectually and allowing yourself to be open to changing your point of view. Um, those kind of things don't happen very much anymore. Uh, largely, it is a, um, we, we like things to be very, very simple. And if, uh, if, if family is difficult, well, then it's much easier to find something else. You know, and, and of course, we're going to surround ourselves with people that agree with us um, to strengthen us uh, in our position, which, believe it or not, one of the reasons, one of the points of, of family you kind of pointed on right there, and that is to challenge your beliefs. It's an important thing that you don't just surround yourself with people that just agree with you all the time. If you do that, you know, if you were wrong, you'd never know it. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we like, but we like that because of the fact that we don't, we really don't want to, in our society, we really don't want to be right. I mean, correct. We just want to be right. You know, <laughs> we're not, we're, lo we're not looking for truth. We're looking for, to be right. And, and that's, that's, that's a problem. That's a real sickness. So, okay. Other thoughts about it and, and try to stay on because we go into a lot of other questions. Okay. That, One thing that I kind of, definitely noticed is the lack of adoption when it comes when it talks about family mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's like it was purposely left out that mm -hmm. that you know it's it's you know having friends or you know just live-ins or whatever but mm -hmm. the, the adoption never never came up mm -hmm. yeah you know probably I mean, because of the fact that traditionally that's always been accepted because you can you can adopt a child into a family and that be considered a, a real family. Which is exactly how we got into God's family. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's by the spirit of adoption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so I think, you know, I have very very close friends, mm -hmm. and um, but they really, that's what they are. They're very very close friends. Mm -hmm. They are they are not family. Mm -hmm. Right. And. Um, I treat them as if they're family mm -hmm. because of the because of that closeness. Yeah. But it you, you can't step over the line. Yeah. You know, I mean like, like Debbie and I, you know, we've been friends since ninth, tenth grade. Tenth mm -hmm. grade. You know. She and I are very close. You know, we call each other sis from time to time. But 
knowing there's still that that boundary there where yeah. we're really not sisters. Yeah. We are the best of friends. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, I mean, the I think Brianna and Nathan were calling her Aunt Debbie, which is which is fine. It's mm -hmm. it's not a uh, it's a term of respect. Endearment and respect. Yes. yes. Other than mm -hmm. actual. Yeah, that can be done. I mean, that we that's done a lot even in this church and there's nothing wrong with that just so long as the children understand you know uh, uncle mark really isn't your real uncle right you know he's he's not blood he's very very close and we we kind of adopt him into the family but he isn't family yeah that's, that's important that's, that needs to be communicated yeah that's the way that we were brought up is oh yeah i was here you know i mean they didn't want to hear mr and mrs smith yeah they'd rather hear you know aunt betty and uncle don yeah exactly so. I, I grew up with that as well and, but but it was still very clear in my family that yeah. uh, like uh, um, the Winers. I just thought about them the other day. I forget their first names. Uh, Marge and uh, Jim. 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 Yeah, it was Uncle Jim and Aunt Marge, and uh, they were. But they were, and and also my um, the Taylors, who used to own Hawker's Fish Market, grew up with them, and um, he was Uncle Earl and uh, and uh, Aunt Chris. But uh, but I, it was very very clear that they weren't family. Um, they were they were loved. They were they were brought in and treated as family, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there was a clear line of delineation, even though the words were being used. You know what I'm saying? It was still communicated, and a child can understand that. I understood it. You know that you know they're really not real family, but you know we you know we, we're close with them, and so we've you know we've allowed you to use that term largely, like you said. It was because of the fact that the Mr. and Mrs. was so formal, and it had a it has a little bit of a tone of. Uh, of distance when we didn't want that distance, but uh, for a four or five or twelve year old, be calling someone in their their sixties and seventies by their first name, it was it really wasn't proper, and I still kind of agree with that yeah. kind of thinking. Um, so this was a, a compromise, and uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, there's but there's a big difference between between that and what is being suggested here. Right. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. um, but they were, they were Christians. They were all. Yeah, well, I mean, well, yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know if the winers were, but um, I know for sure um, uh, the tailors were for sure, right? So, uh, um, another, uh, another thought concerning this first one, does this redefining of family work to destroy the reason why God created the family? Let me ask you, why did God create the family? Okay, so to, to, rep to represent the Godhead. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Did you say something, Dora? I'm just saying it's an extension of the Holy Trinity. Okay, there you go. It's, it's to re Everything that God did, his, God has fingerprints all, all, all over it, and it's intended to reflect his image. Mm -hmm. Everything he does. And the family, you're absolutely right. You nailed it. The first intention of, give, of giving family was to represent in our everyday life, and then it in an, an immersive learning environment, what it is that God is. God is a triunity. We use that word on Wednesday, right? I introduced that word to you. I've used it before, but I reintroduced it to you on Wednesday that you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work together in perfect unity. Amen. And uh, and inside of that, there's agreement, and inside of that, there are. But there's still three individuals that are distinct in their personalities and distinct in their operations. You see all the way through Scripture, God, the Father God, who we often would have called, in the Old Testament, would have called El Shaddai or El Gibor or any of number of the L's. E-L is the prefix for God's name in the Old Testament. Um, he's always the idea guy, you know. Uh, he's the one that framed the worlds. In other words, the entire, everything that was created was conceptualized in the mind of the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ was the actual one who did the creating, the Scriptures say, without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. He was the creator. He was the architect, the one that actually, in other words, the blueprint maker was the father. The actual constructor was the, uh, was the Lord Jesus Christ, or who was called at the time the living word. But the Holy Spirit was the enabling, the, the, um, the helper, if you will, that aided Christ in his work um, and, uh, and, and did very, very specific things. Most of them had to do with nurturing or or uh, like at the very beginning, the first job that you see of the Holy Spirit and is he's brooding like a hen over the face of the waters, warming them, 
that was what he was doing. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Hebrew, it also includes the notion of, in, of transferring energy into it. Um, that was the work of the Holy Spirit. And so you see, they all have very distinctive roles. They do different things, but they work together as a collective whole, right? And that is what family was supposed to look like. So, yeah, you're right. Absolutely, that's the first thing. What else? Yes, uh-huh. Uh, this came to me, and, and I just kind of, maybe you can explain it. Um, in Genesis, on, in 12, in the call of Abram, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, mm -hmm. and from thy father's house. That's right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Is there? That's working the family. That's working the family. God speaking to the whole family. Oh yeah, absolutely. He told them to get away mm -hmm. because of what they were doing. I would assume there were well, lots of reasons. What he knew Abraham would do, and mm -hmm. they wouldn't. Yeah, there was a lot of reasons why that happened, and we're going to address that in just a little bit um, um, about are there are there ever exceptions to this, oh. and an exception is that. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and address it, seeing it's already on the table. Uh, in order for God to do, number one, God's sovereign, right? And so whatever God has laid out as being what he wants to do, he's always going to meet that agenda. But you also got to see that God's got levels of things he's wanting to do. And the first thing that he wants to do is redeem mankind after the fall. And so that is priority number one. Sometimes priority number one doesn't always line up with priority number two. Sometimes this one's going to have to take precedence. In order to do that, he had to call out a man that God could create a bloodline through which the Messiah could come. And Moses, I'm sorry, and Abraham, when he was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldea was a land that family was everything. Um, if, you, if you were to um, walk away from, from family in Chaldea, you literally were declaring poverty on yourself. Because you couldn't, you, you, Chaldea was a land where you couldn't go out and apply for a job. You were born into one. Uh, you, the sons always took on the family trait of the father, always, with no exceptions. There wasn't a boy that says, well, I feel like a pianist. Well, that's great. You, you can play piano when you go home, but today you're going to be working in, in the stall because that's what you are. You know, that's the way it was in Chaldea. You, there wasn't any self-actualization. Everybody continued with the family business. And so to divorce yourself from family was automatically to declare poverty on yourself in that society. You could not have gone, he could not have gone someplace else in Chaldea and said, I'd like to apply for a job here, please. They'd never heard that phrase in their life. It was a totally foreign concept in Chaldea. Secondarily, of course, they worshiped Nanan, the, the moon god. Um, they had a ziggurat in the middle of the city, much like a pyramid. So pyramids were not a new thing to, to, Moses, uh, to Abraham in any way. Uh, god was having to pull him out of a society that was entrenched in a way of thinking that was completely contrary to what God was trying to establish. So he had to call a man out. And when he did, he told him, you have to, you can't keep uh, a, a, you can't keep any tendrils back in that city. You're going to have to cut it off. It's going to have to be a clean break. And of course, he didn't do that. We know that. He went, uh, he went north to Mesopotamia and brought his, uh, his uh, brother-in-law with him and, uh, and, uh, and others with him. And then he left some there and he still took his nephew with him and started, he, he took him forever to finally do what God told him to do and to shed all the extra baggage because it was so part of who he was to hold on to that. But it was important that God get him to divorce from all these things because of the fact that in the middle of all that, there was, um, there was an entrapment towards what would eventually be considered idolatry because it was worship of another God. Their entire society was centered around that God. And so he had to pull him out of that. So, uh, so yeah, so there are times when priority A doesn't always line up with priority B, and God will go with this one. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, God, this is one of the, the misconceptions that I run into on Facebook all the time with people that believe in inclusionism and universalism, is they, they believe the idea that God always gets what he wants. And I don't know where the heck they got that. They couldn't get it from reading the Bible. God rarely, in fact, gets what he wants. Um, you know, now... There are two different phrases that are used in the Bible. There are the purposes of God, and then there are the desires of God. The desires of God are rarely met. The purposes of God, you can't stop. You understand what I'm saying? When God talks about what he purposes to make happen, he will do everything, including taking your free will away from you to make it happen. He will do it. It's going to get done, period. Okay? What he purposes to be done. 
But when it comes to the things he desires, that's like down here in Terrace 2 or 3 or 4, and he may or may not get that. You know, and a great example of that was God wanted to, um, to uh, uh, let Israel free from, uh, from Egypt. And he did not want to destroy Pharaoh in order to make that happen. He would have loved to have reconciled Pharaoh's heart and an entire nation to the heart of God, but Pharaoh would have none of it. And so God came to him. You know, God could have just killed him and been done with it. You know, he could have just come in there and done any number of things, but instead he brought ten plagues, all of them progressively getting towards the point where he's going to cut off his posterity, his, his offspring, in order to get uh, Pharaoh to do what he needed to do. And the reason why God didn't just go in there and, and make it happen, though he could have, it's within God's sovereignty to be able to do that. God had delegated authority to Pharaoh in the first place. The scripture says it was for this purpose that I rose you as an individual up. Not just, this isn't why I created the position of Pharaoh. I rose you as an individual up and placed you in the position of being Pharaoh so that I might show my power and my strength through you. That was God's intention with Pharaoh. But Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to have any of it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to build my own kingdom and do my own thing my own way. And no, you can't have what you want, God. And so what does God do? He goes in there and he brings the ten plagues to the point where eventually Pharaoh lets him go. And it winds, and in the end, Pharaoh winds up dying because as soon as he begins to see all of his work labor go off, he gets ticked off and pursues him and winds up dying. Dying was the last recourse. God did not want that man to die. He would have rather reconciled his heart. But one way or the other, the purpose of God in raising Pharaoh was to make his name famous and to let his power be known to the surrounding nations. The scripture says that was the purpose of God. And God got that out of Pharaoh. He could have gotten it out of Pharaoh agreeing with God. But even if he didn't agree with God, God still got it out of Pharaoh. He extracted it out of him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that was his purpose. Am I correct? And, and didn't God harden? God yes, he did. Heart? Yes, absolutely. But it was in reaction to the decisions of Pharaoh. Okay. You can see, and we, we can look at that again in a little bit later when we look in Romans, the first chapter, which we'll probably get to. Uh, and this is, a, this is a, one of those things that, again, is largely misunderstood. Because you'll read in one place, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then another place says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Both are true. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Pharaoh, what he did was he dug his heels and said, I will not. And God says, okay, if that's your decision, well then me, the one who's sovereign, that created your heart, and only I have got power to either soften or harden it. I, as a result, as a reaction to your decision, am hardening your heart so that you can't respond to me. Yeah. You know, if you don't have and hold on to what yes. you do have, will be taken from you. Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay, good thoughts. So, okay, so then the second thing is, of course, the first thing is that God reveals his his intention with family was to reveal Himself, reveal the Godhead. The other thing was to reveal the relationship that humans were to have with God, a family relationship with God. Amen. That was the second purpose. And the third one was to create an environment in which creating and facilitating character development towards God's image could take place naturally and intuitively. It'd be a natural thing to understand how to relate with God if you understand how to inter interact inside of a family. It would be a natural process. God makes learning easy. We are the ones that make it hard. We're the ones that pull people out of their home, put them in a desk and a blackboard, and, and try to force information in their cranium and we call that learning process god never intended that god intended that the young men and the young women be raised by their parents and learn as they walk through the way not from somebody that they've never met before who they have to call teacher because they don't know this person and is just shoving vast amounts of information in their cranium well at that point is it any wonder that they exit 12 years later with a bunch of information but no wisdom how to apply it They've never been taken behind the desk. They, all they've done is had information thrown at them, and like a parrot, they're supposed to regurgitate it. And if you regurgitate it at the right time, you get an A, and if you regurgitate it at the wrong time or in the wrong way, you get an F. But it doesn't show any practical application. This person has no... Some of the worst people when it comes to being able to live life are A students. The worst. That, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm not making that up. Statistically, it's true. A students, those that are whizzes when it comes to do with schoolwork, often when it comes to work uh, to real life epically fail because the fact that see in the classroom it was structured and the answer is always this one in fact 
it's it's not just it's not just this thought it's these three words is the answer they know that when you get into real life there is no real three answer answers to anything you're gonna have to learn how to live on the fly you're gonna have to know how to interact with people you're gonna have to understand why one plus one equals two not just be able to answer it you need to understand why it's true you know what I'm saying and and, and because we don't ever teach children to think we teach them to just cough up information or parrot information they haven't learned anything you know, they go to school and you, you come out with an education, mm -hmm. but they have absolutely no common sense. Very little. You're right. I mean, even shopping, going to the grocery store. Oh my gosh. You know, all they oh. have, all they do is stand there and scan the little thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the bill comes up and it's say sixteen dollars and two cents, and you hand them twenty one dollars and two cents. Mm -hmm. If they don't hit that change bar. They don't know what to give you back. I know. We ran into that just last week. We had a, a, a young lady who was, um, uh, who was, it was her first day, so you have to give her a break. You know, it was her first day. And anybody on their first day, it's already kind of pressure. Right. And we were being very, very light with her, lighthearted, um, trying to keep it easy on her because I didn't want her to feel, you know, like she's falling apart. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, made a couple of jokes, you know, tried to, you know, make sure she knew that we weren't upset. You know what I mean? Because that just makes things worse. Yeah. And uh, um, so anyway, tried to be diffusing as possible. And she seemed to be very lighthearted, but the, the girl couldn't make change to save her life. And a manager had to come up, and the manager could not make change. <laughs> I'm not lying to you. They looked at the change, how much it was, and they both were adding up the difference. Uh, I think it was 64 cents was um, what we gave, and it was a full, uh, was, was due. And the full amount was, we just gave a, a full you know, dollar amount. So they, what they were supposed to give back was, what was that supposed to be? Um, 36 cents. Um, they had, she had it all over the place. The, the one, the, the manager had it at 20 some odd cents and, and the, the girl that was sitting, uh, that was doing, ringing the register thing up, she had it at a dollar something. And originally she was giving me $10 in change back when it was supposed mm -hmm. to be only a dollar in change. And I told her, I said, honey, I said, no, 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 no. No, I said, I, I gave you 20, not 30. And she said, oh, so, uh, so the 10? is yours. <laughs> she didn't know. She totally right. did not know. <laughs> I'm just like, wow. And, and she, she had to be, what, would you guess probably in her mid-20s at least? So she's been through high school, more than likely. But th that doesn't mean anything. No. So, uh, you know, so yeah, go ahead. I've had them give it back to me in, with, in nickels. Mm -hmm. Number 5, 10, 15, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, you know if they can count by down. fives, I'm proud of them. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, that that that's that's the side uh, thought, but nonetheless, so to create an environment, one of the reasons why God created family was to create an environment in which we could learn how to interact with God in an area in an environment that is natural to human beings to learn. People learn by doing, not by hearing alone. You know what I'm saying? By, uh, that's the reason why he told the, the young men uh, or the fathers, take your young men out into the field or into the smith's shop or into the carpenter's shop and see them. Put, the, put the, 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 the hammer in their hand. Let them swing and miss a couple of dozen times. They're going to learn. They're going to probably destroy some furniture between here and the time that they become like you. But I'm asking you to duplicate yourself and your child. Amen. And they learned as they were doing. There was wisdom involved. Before it was all said and done, the father, it was a beautiful process because when it was time, by the time the young man had become as proficient as the father, the father literally could begin to retire and the son took over the family business. And the father still was in there and would help and still give advice, but you know, it, there was a transition, the passing of the torch, the passing of the baton, and that was the way it was intended. And, but instead, everybody always breaks off now and starts their own little brand new thing and it's all, it's all very self-actualizing. I've got to make my own way. And that's not the way God intended it. And it's, so you'd see that just the beginning of divorcing yourself from the, the core of family automatically generates um, uh, um, uh, lifestyles to live out of that are not healthy and are not godly. And they teach. That's just it. Lifestyles teach. They're saying something. And is it consi consistent with the image of God or does it distort his image? That's the issue. That's what makes it sin, by the way. When we distort the image of God, that is when it becomes sin. Yeah. Well, I wanted to read my phrase, but I also wanted to comment real quick. 
Um, you're talking about your father, you know, kind of teaching along the way in, in the family business, you know, mm -hmm. holding the hammer, you know, coming alongside you at a young age. Um, I'm reminded of a friend who had issues when she was younger, and a lot of the things that her father told her to do were good learning experiences, and they were good chores, they were good responsibility things. Mm -hmm. um, but what made it harsh to her was the lack of relationship in him doing it. Yeah. It was a command and a, you go do this now, and Absolutely. I'm going to go do this now, mm -hmm. or rather than working alongside and exactly. talking and having yeah. relationship in the process mm -hmm. and you know not constantly correcting but yeah. encouraging and instructing yeah you know and and that in itself is yet another characteristic and another picture of what god wants to do to walk alongside us yes and to encourage us and train us and as we go yeah and and throughout the day as we you know along the way mm -hmm. and you know so that gets distorted sometimes too even mm -hmm. in a family but again, it was it was part of the, the true picture that God wanted to paint. Exactly. Um, the phrase I had written here was, um, in response to the first question, um, we may not immediately see why, but we should pause whenever we see the word that someone trying to redefine God's words. He has a purpose, and he says it's okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't remember. He has a purpose. And this says it is okay to change. By redefining it, it says it's okay to change who God is mm -hmm. and what he's like. Absolutely. And it destroys the living example. That's exactly right. And I think, and also inside of the, the family, the, one of the intents is not only for, of course, the child to learn, but for the parent to learn. Because um, it gives you, you got the cycle of life. You start off as the student, but you also end up as the student. Right. You know? Now you're, now you're the instructor who's also learning. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's intended to be that way. Um, an example that I'll pull from my own personal life was uh, with my dad. Um, you know, he, he loved us very much, but, you know, he also, at the very, very beginning, early on in our, in our, our life, my dad corrected sometimes out of anger. And one time he, he hurt my sister, not terribly, he just got a welt on her. And he decided, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. And so because he loved us, and knew he couldn't control his anger at the time, he decided, I'm just not spanking him anymore. That's going to be your problem. And, uh, and passed it off to my mom, uh, which I'm sure she just was delighted with that. But, um, but now, now there's two things. You know, I'm thankful that I had a dad that recognized his limitations and decided, you know what, I'm not going to correct because of the fact that I'm going to do out of anger and I'll hurt them. But what was intended by God is recognize your weakness, bring it to me, and allow me to temper that anger. And over a period of time through his life, he got to the point where he was not an explosive person anymore. But he was early on. Uh, but he never took back up the rod and corrected in love. He just stopped correcting. And see, that that is, he dropped the ball there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and I'm not picking on my dad because I'm grateful that he at least saw he doesn't want to hurt us. You know what I mean? So this is good. I, I'm, not, I'm not demonizing my father by any means. I'm just showing you as an example that right there, there was an opportunity to grow in character. Because you, you're, 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 you're kind of like stuck between two things. You know what is right, and you've got a sense of justice, and, and so you're, you're angered because of what's going on. But you also have this love for your children, and you don't want to hurt them. And so this right there, that pressure we talked about earlier, God wants you right there. That's a great place to learn, right in the middle of the pressure. But what we want is a pressure release valve. Okay, I'm not going to do it anymore. You see what I'm saying? The easy route. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the child winds up not, it painted, it began to paint a picture that was not consistent with God. It was, the, it was my father's responsibility to discipline us. It was not my mother's. And because that was the transfer that took place, it was teaching something to me yeah. that was inconsistent with Scripture. Are you following me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Inconsistent with the pattern of the Father. Yeah. Jesus himself says, I'm not judging anybody. This is going to be done through the Father. Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't judge us. Who judges us? You do. No, the Father does. The Father judges us. Right? Now, yeah, the Holy Spirit can aid us in judging ourselves. You're right. But if we don't, if we don't correct our own behavior, and correction has got to come, it's coming from Papa. It's, it's not coming from Mama. It's not coming from Son. So when we begin to do it another way, we're distorting the image. Are you following me? And so no wonder it's been such a huge thing for the enemy. It is one of the biggest blows he's made to our society is to get the father out of the home. 
Or if you can't get him out of the home, have him get him disinterested and non-functioning in the home. And the first way that we've done that is that overwhelmingly in our nation, women have a tendency to be more spiritual than men. Not because men don't or not have a proclivity towards it, it's because of the fact that, um, number one, one of the reasons is because there's a tremendous amount of pressure. There's a lot of pressure being both sexes. There isn't anything, one's not trumping the other when it comes to pressure. But there is, the, the buck in the family stops, as far as God's concerned, with the man, with the father, period. If the family is going in the wrong direction, it may, it may be a collective fault, but the person he's coming to is dad. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. That's who he's looking to. And there's a reason for this. Because again, it points back to the Godhead. Are you following? I mean, if Jesus, if Jesus had constructed the earth exactly as the blueprint went, and it, and it wound up not working, whose fault was that? Well, it would have been the Father's. It was his blueprint. I mean, he's ultimately, the per, you see what I'm saying? Ultimately, the idea person, the person that is in the head, it, the buck stops with them. And there's a lot of pressure there. And the enemy is going to do everything you can because our society is all about that. We will release pressure. And so what, what do we do? We walk away from it. And, uh, and the, the very first area that men typically drop the ball in their families, they don't lead them in spiritual matters. You know, one of the things that, you know, you can say what you want negatively about the Duggars. One thing that I like about them, I like a lot of things about them. But, um, but one of the things I liked about them is that at least it looked like almost every single morning, the family would gather early in the morning and they would have, um, the father would open the Bible and they would read and they would talk about scripture in their living room every day. Who was leading that? The person that ought to be leading that. The father. Yes? I, I may be oversimplifying things, but um, well, probably all of it's been said, but uh, as to why he cre why God created the family and the purpose of unity and communion. Yes. Just to put it in because there's a lot mm -hmm. that can come under each of those. That's things, right. But the unity, because we want a family unit. He does. Not a family that's part of each other. Discord. Yeah. Just look at the Old Testament examples of mm -hmm. tribes and nations. That's right. And so, and to do that, it collectively deals with all the other things we've been talking about, and that is you've got to press through the hard things, because there's going to be initial disagreements sometimes, isn't it? That's where the communion comes yeah, that's right. Where you break down exactly and work through something, and in the end, now this this is another example where our society, and I'm getting ahead of myself, where our society was completely dead wrong. You know, the, you, you had a, a whole TV series named it "Father Knows Best." Mm -hmm. Father doesn't always know best. Sometimes mom did. Now. What, what it should have said, and what it probably was representing if you watched the show, was that the buck ends with dad. What he says goes. Well, that is true, and that is right. scriptural, and that is right. Yeah. But is but is his decision always right? No, sometimes it's dead wrong. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And, and who is God going to hold responsible for whether the right decision was followed or the wrong one? Not the family, the dad. You see what I'm saying? But, you know, so, but, but the whole idea of father knows best, that's really not accurate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody ever always knows best except for God, right? You right. know what I mean? There's no human ever always knows best. You know what I mean? So, okay, let's go to the next one. The next one, number two. Start at the starting at the beginning of this article, what are the first words that should cause Christians to immediately suspect foul play? What do you think? What do you think? What would you say? Uh, or the, in quotes, normal family. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the normal family. Okay, there you go. Okay. So, so the, the, the satire on the whole normal bit, or certainly not um, the one that's staying in the home part of it, but yeah, what do you think? It starts off with subjective reasoning. You know, see, the reasoning of a Christian starts, develops, and ends here. It doesn't start, develop, and end here. Right? Right. Who cares what Mark thinks about it? If Mark doesn't think what that thinks, what Mark thinks is irrelevant. You know what I mean? So, and this is one of the this is one of the the, the great things and negative things of, of, of blogging coming into the world X number of years ago, um, is it facilitates people developing their thoughts. And this now I want you to hear this real quickly that a lot of these people that wrote these things in here probably had never actually thought through and written out what their thoughts are about. Them. Right. 
But, you know, this article invited them to come into a think tank of people that are all subjectively thinking their own thoughts and work their way through it and put it into words. Now that they've done that, if they hear the truth now, they've already got a resistance to it, don't they? Right. Because they've already developed their own subjective way of thinking. Yeah. Yes. One thing I saw in the, the answers that these people gave, several of them still referred back to their original father, yeah. mother, family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the thoughts and ideas are still there. Yeah, that's right. At least at this point. Yeah. Now, of course, we have two or three more generations like this one. It'll be foreign because they haven't experienced it, right? right? right. But you're right, absolutely. And and that's a that's another thing that goes back to you can do nothing against the truth, you know. In order to have a framework to work for it from, you have to go back to the original, all right? That's the way it is. So uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so the third one. Do you think that this societal hurt the societal hurting in a direction completely counter to the biblical model is an accident or a deliberate influence of Satan on our society? Yeah. It's very much delivered. Uh, go ahead, someone look up Acts chapter 13. The Lord brought this to my mind this morning as I was going over this um, quickly before we uh, get started. Acts chapter 13, when someone gets there, read verse 6 through 12. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 12. When they had gone through the island of Patmos, they found a certain sorcerer false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul, and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, I just wait, I guess, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Okay. <clears throat> Look what the intention was. The enemy always is trying to go ahead of the gospel and to influence people of influence. Are you following? Mm -hmm. This person was on the pro-council that, 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 was, that was being influenced. And they have two different people, both of them, one of them having a direct connection with the pro-council, able to influence that person, right? And what are they trying to do? Trying to pull them away from the gospel into subjective thinking. Are you following? Mm -hmm. This is not, this isn't unique. This happens all the time. It's happened just the other day. Yes, it's absolutely. The Supreme Court. That's exactly right. So you have the, gotten out, and this is where Christians can get off. And so it's very, I'll just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. I'll just mention it real quickly in passing. This is where people can come to wrong conclusions, even though we try to have right conclusions. Um, you'll have people of influence. That will um, that will sidestep the directives of God by becoming subjective in their thinking and try to push through laws that don't uh, should not um, should probably not exist, um, and come from that position and think well then therefore that person doesn't belong in a position of authority. Well, that's not biblical. The Bible says that God placed that person in a position of authority. But the issue is not whether or not they have that authority given them by God, but whether or not they are misusing it. You see what I'm saying? Right. Now, if we were dealing with something simple like a family, and especially if we were talking 50 years ago, no one would question whether or not that father who's abusive really has God-given authority in that home. They would know that he did. They would also recognize that God placed him in that position. They also would recognize that he's abusing and misusing the authority God gave him. We all, they also would know that according to Scripture, God does not just take away authority. You see it with Pharaoh, remember? Pharaoh, God could have, if, if it was in God's character just to give authority and then yank it away, he could have just yanked the authority away from Pharaoh. He said, you know what, well, you're not Pharaoh anymore. There you go. You know, if that's what he wanted to do, that's the way God planned, played. But he doesn't. 
He delegated authority to a certain man, and he was misusing and abusing that authority and hurting God's people. And God did not just come in and just change that immediately. He went through a channel of authority that he placed there. He was asking Pharaoh to change his mind. You see what I'm saying? It's not like God was lacking power and he couldn't have just yanked them out of, uh, out of Egypt without his permission. You know what I mean? Couldn't have God done that? I mean, we see with Philip the Evangelist, he comes up out of the water, disappears, and appears on another place on the planet. Could God have done that with all of Israel? Just one day, bam, they're in the middle of the wilderness. Sure he could have. But that's not the way God operates. He had delegated authority to a man that was misusing and abusing it. And so he used that channel of authority. And Pharaoh willingly, though definitely through coercion, God was pressing on him, creating pressure. But he didn't make the decision for Pharaoh. Pharaoh made the decision. Go. Leave. Please leave. Right? And then when they left, he changes his mind. Right? But he'd already let them go, hadn't he? And they were already free people. At this point, he would have had to recapture them and reinforce them back into, into forced labor. And so God said, okay, you know what? You're done. And just kill them. But up to this point, God was using the authority that he established. The man was using the authority in an ungodly way. No one can question that. Okay? But that God is the one. The scriptures are very apparent twice. It says, for this reason, I, God, rose you, Pharaoh, up. Right? So we can come to, to bad conclusions. And we think, well, you know, if people are doing this sort of thing, well, therefore, they don't belong in that position. No, 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 no. God placed them there on purpose. Sometimes, knowing they were going to be doing the very thing that they are doing, and knowing that the end result of that was going to bring pressure on the body of Christ to do what they need to do, which is exactly what's happening in America right now. Absolutely. One of the first things that's happening in America is, Karen and I were just talking about this yesterday. <clears throat> you know, the truth of the matter is, if you go back far enough, in American history, we started the seeds of what we are reaping right now almost 200 years ago. Almost 200 years ago. When, 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 when all of a sudden we decided it was going to be a good idea to educate our children outside of the home. That was the first bad step in the wrong direction. I mean as, a, as Christians. I mean as a nation that was, a, it was Christian. So it was largely Christian morality or people with Christian morals that were making these decisions. And in fact, and, and we had we had good intentions. One of the things we wanted was to teach them to be able to read and write the Bible specifically. That was what the early church uh, schools were intended to do. But instead of them, and what they should have done is brought in the mothers and educated them, <coughs> and then sent them home and let them educate their children. And then that point on to be self-replicating, wouldn't it? Wow. Yes. From that point on, the children already knows when they become a mother, they'll be able to teach their child. But instead what they do is they kept on shipping their kids off to somebody else to have someone else educate yeah. them. Interesting. That was the beginning of it. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, you get into some situations where um, uh, it was, wasn't too long after, actually it wasn't very long at all, after they started doing that, that the nation decided to just start, um, uh, um, in certain areas, have property tax. It was not long after they started that that they started property tax. And in, in the middle of property tax, that's when, the, because before, the church often was the schoolhouse as well. It doubled mm -hmm. as a schoolhouse. That's how involved the church. This was not a world problem. We created this monster. Right. The church did. Right. The body of Christ did. And then so we began to people began, began to get uh, taxed on their property. And so they can't afford to do this anymore. And so what do they do? They apply for government aid and assistance. Now who are they beholding to? We started this a long time ago, guys. It's amazing. It has kept from owning us up to this day. Nothing short of God's incredible mercy has kept us from reaping what we've sown. Yeah. But D-Day's here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Let's get ready. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it, it all began all the way back then. Us surrendering our rights and following in a way that was contrary to what Scripture said. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it started with the dismantling of the home. It, it robbed woman of her glory and of her grace. That mother was intended to be the one that reared and taught those children until they reached a certain age. At, after they reached a certain age, she continued to teach her daughter, and the young man went off with the father. Right? Mm -hmm. And now, now, what 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 happened? And I mean, uh, what happened if the father passed away? <clears throat> the scripture covers that. Talks about the fact that you have relatives, and if you've got a brother, or if you've got an uncle or a grandfather, they went with them. They returned home, but they worked with them during the day. If there wasn't anybody like that, at that point, you went beyond that to people that were close friends. Right. There was always an excuse. There was always something else that could meet it. 
and still stay within the biblical framework. But what we did was we chose a pressure release valve, yeah. something that was easier. Now, what does it cost us? It cost us everything. All, I mean, all, you, all it takes is give the devil an inch. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And just wait. Yeah, he will take a mile. Will take a mile this morning. Absolutely he will. All right, so let's look at some more. Um, uh, number four. In what ways do you believe you have witnessed the average Christian home being affected by this redefining of the family, its structures and functions? In what ways do you think you've witnessed it? Go ahead. Well, you you brought up one thing about the woman being the spiritual leader because mm -hmm. he's not. Yeah. A lot of times men will not be. <clears throat> but I mean, even in Christian homes, there's um, there is divorce, mm -hmm. remarriage, mm -hmm. um, you know, all kinds of of different things, you know, and. Um, But base, you know, basically, you're right. You know, it's the mm -hmm. man not letting take his responsibility, it's and huge. then the it's not that woman mm -hmm. wants it, but it's almost like somebody needs to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody it's needs take something. To, She'll yeah. take that authority on. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, you're right. That's a mm -hmm. huge one. Surrendering authority, and, and, and it's it's something that. And you need to understand, more than likely, God put that in the programming of man. Because of that, it would require us to rely upon him instead of just upon our own strength. You see it there even before the fall. Adam immediately, he, instead of stepping to the plate, he's right there. And it says, you know, it says that and Adam was with her. And instead of him stepping in and saying, you know what, darling, no. God said, we're not doing this. We're, talking, we're walking away now. You and I, right now. And I mean, this isn't a question. This is a statement. We're leaving. Did, 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 did he step to the plate? No. no. He just sat there and watched the whole thing unfold. Well, he didn't want responsibility. <coughs> Absolutely. Divorced himself of all responsibility. And this was this is before the fall. This is before corruption had come into man. There was a proclivity to, okay, well, you do what you want. That's a dangerous thing. Yeah. And, and, and men largely, in our nation, largely, have not known how to take that authority without being abusive. They, if they decide that they're going to take the authority, they take it, yeah. rather than let it be given. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The, the, you know, the Bible, I love something that Brother, Brother Keith Moore taught us in school. On, and we had a whole semester on, on submission and authority. And uh, that's where I learned the phrase that I've told you guys many times, that your first chance to submit is when you don't agree. And I got that from Keith Moore. That's not original with me. Um, another thing was that, you know, he read through the examples of what Scripture says to men and to women. And one of the things, he said, you know, when he was reading it, and, and Peter it says, Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. He says, now, who was he speaking to? <laughs> <laughs> Did he say, husbands, see to it that your wife submit? No, he wasn't even talking to you men. <laughs> he was talking to the wife. Yeah. She, and the word, you know the word, what is it? It's hupo... Faso, willingly, voluntarily place yourself under. It's not you make yourself her Lord, she submits to you willingly. Is it her responsibility to do so? Oh yeah, and if she doesn't do it, she's sinning. But is it your job to make her submit? No, he wasn't even talking to you. He wasn't even talking to the man, was he? He was talking to the woman. He told her, your job was to love her. Even if she doesn't submit, love her. Right? That's your job. That's what he told the man, right? Give yourself to her as Christ gave himself to the church. Love her. I mean, and if, if, the, if the man is doing that, it's it's A lot easy. of times. Well, if well, yeah. he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, it is easier. It is easy oh, to yeah. submit. Yes, it is. Because and most people, very... most women will automatically do it. Not everyone. Because there's always, <laughs> there's always going to be, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's always going to be somebody that's, that's not going to do what they need to do, right? On both ends of the fence. Yeah. But yeah. You're right. It makes it a lot easier to, to place yourself underneath somebody. In fact, you can you can willingly and lovingly follow someone that you know might be not always making the right decision if you know that in their decisions they're considering you and they love you. Mm -hmm. You're willing to follow them off the end of a cliff practically, you know? All right. But you know, but but a person that is well now automatically now you just ended it, right? Because now that is that an excuse for a woman not to submit? No, but you just made it a whole lot harder. 
You know what I mean? Isn't it true? I mean, didn't God say that the law, when the law came, sin revived? A desire to do the very thing he said don't do just rose up on the inside of it. All you need, don't you see that in children? Don't you see that in you? All you need is someone to say is, you can't do this. Oh. All of a sudden, what do you want? I want to do that. I love what Kathy said again. I'm going to tell on you. <laughs> the other day she sang in the woman's group. She said, I went to the restroom and I saw the sign, don't enter the room. And she said, oh, that made me want to open the door so bad. <laughs> she said, I was good. I didn't. But boy, I wanted to. And But isn't that the truth? You know, all you need is someone to say, don't. And what do you want to do? Oh, even if you didn't want to do it before, now you want to do it. You know what I mean? And that's what the law did. The law came and said, you shall not. Oh, yeah, I will. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so what did God do? When he came in through the death of his son and the resurrection of his son, he says, now I've taken, he didn't take the law away. He wrote it on our heart. And then he brought the Holy Spirit to influence us toward behavior that is right. No longer is it a law out here demanding behavior. It's a relationship that I learn like a son going to work with his father. Amen? Amen. And I learn it as I walk through the way yeah. with him. Yes, Lord. I just realized there's all the, you know, looking at this the Christian home now, it's like this, one of the tools that has been developed to try and get it back on track, and, and it's not a perfect tool, but obviously it, it has its merit, mm -hmm. is the one that was mentioned, is throwing kids God's way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. It's, neat, it's needed, and so therefore God had someone to develop it. <clears throat> Absolutely. It's, a, it's amazing to me how many things that they brought up, Christians did not know. Mm -hmm. That, 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 to me, alone is a sign of how desperately we need to know the Word, you know? Because, I mean, the, the stuff that they brought up in there really was kind of common sense. This was not rocket science. This is this was real simple stuff. Two decades ago. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. But it was, I mean, it was, it was neat watching the actual couples, because we have yeah. a lot of singles here. Mm -hmm. But watching the couples and what it did, I mean, for Tony and Bimini, it was like, Bing, 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 bing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lights and sirens going off. Mm -hmm. and, and to see them light up. Oh, yeah. And they obviously had put it into practice. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And yeah. it was just, it was it was cool. Oh, yeah, Watch I agree it. with you. Absolutely. When this comes about, it's interesting because all the church hasn't dropped the ball. Oh, absolutely. No <laughs> question. I mean, this, it, all of this is, is, there's a lot of dropping the ball going on, right? It's not just any one person. They can't, it can't go back to one, one thing. Okay, I'm going to read the question, and then again, and I'll just give you a handful of things that we wrote here. Um, in what ways do you, think, do you believe that uh, you've witnessed the average Christian home being affected by this redefining of the family, its structure, and its functions? Um, one of the first ones, of course, is sing single-parent home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is not, and what I mean by that is single-parent homes unnecessarily. There are some times when you have a single-parent home because it was unavoidable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Death or, or, you know, in some cases, a woman was raped and she winds up carrying the baby as she should and has a, has a child. It's going to be a single parent home. And that's hard, isn't it? That, but that is an unnecessary, it is unnecessary because the other should never have happened. But the point is, it was through no fault of her own. Are you following me necessarily? Okay. Um, so just, I say that because of the fact that there are things that go on in society and have, since we've had people, that create some of these scenarios. So that's the reason why I use the word unnecessarily, okay? There are people that choose to do this, and that makes it wrong. Are you following? Okay. Then you've got um, uh, uh, entire families, well, particularly the head of the family, living off of welfare. Unnecessarily. Now, I mean, if a person becomes disabled or whatever, that's different, isn't it? Right? Are you with me? Now, I'm not saying that these cases, the, the cases where it is not acceptable doesn't exist. I mean... Clearly, there are times when this is acceptable, and it's probably a good thing. But in the end, there's a lot going on that is unnecessary. And if you have a, a, what amounts to a bum of a father that just lives off of the state, what, what is that teaching the next generation? You've already destroyed the image of the Godhead. Already destroyed it, right? So anything that you do after this is going to be distorted. Yeah, what were you saying, Norm? In a lot of cases, they'll go and do likewise. And they will, they will. Perpetuate. That's perpetuate. The, that's the thing nowadays. People that have gotten on welfare, they won't get a job because it's less money if they go get a job. Oh, of course, yeah. It's easier. I'll get more money if I just stay at home. Yeah. 
Right. Nothing. Even in, you know, <clears throat> in Murphy where, you know, unemployment is rampant, nobody yes. can find jobs, they're opening, well, they're building a new casino in town, but yet there's like 450 new jobs, but they can't get anybody to apply. To apply That's because not the they don't want to lose their. That's right. And, yeah, and the scripture says, "What if a man doesn't work, he should not eat." Shouldn't eat, right? And he's like, so the state is coming. Can't find help, even though it's there. It's like even when you drive around and you see signs everywhere, "Help wanted, help wanted," mm -hmm. but yet people say, "Oh, you know," because mm -hmm. they don't want to find a job. That's true. And but and and ultimately, again, the thing that should irritate <clears throat> us about this is not the fact that you pay taxes and are supporting people that are living badly. That's a selfish reason for the Bhagavad. Mm -hmm. The reason why I love this is because it distorts the image of God. Yeah. It is literally taking a race of God's face. Yeah. It distorts him in every way. Right? That ought to bother the person. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the other shouldn't bother you some, but that shouldn't be the big issue. The big issue is this distorts the image of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. That ought to be the core of our, our reasoning, of our hearts. Children being educated by the world. We mentioned that earlier. Um, and, and, and what does it produce? We read it earlier. Uh, we read it in one of, the, one of the answers from Beverly. She said, the way I define family is thinking about how close we are. Because I think people who always make my, my heart feel warm is family. Also, those who treat me like a family member. In some cases, we have spent so much time, more time at school, so friends and the teachers at school become our family. Well, why didn't we see that coming? Yeah. That's obvious. Right? I mean, if, 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 if the person that is influencing your child has more hour than influencing them than you is someone other than you, there's a problem. Right. It's a problem. Right. You're sidestepping God-given grace. God graced you to deal with that. Right. Amen? Not some stranger. Right? Yeah. Okay? Okay, are, the, are all of these, are, are all the result of the, are all the results, I should have said that, I said that, I'm sorry, are all the results of this type of redefining always negative? No. Not always. no. no. Uh, very few, very rarely is everything always negative, right? <laughs> there are some good things that have come out of this. One of the things I think that is a, a good thing that has come out of this <clears throat> is what I was saying earlier about the whole concept. There was a science society back then where because, um, <clears throat> because of the way our society was, we were doing a lot of things right, but we were doing it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Are you following me? I remember when I grew up um, and was attending community Christian school, um, some of the things they taught about male authority, what they taught was right, but their reasons were stupid, and they were wrong. They'd come to the conclusion that the reason why a man is the head of the family is because of the fact that he's smarter than women. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where did you find that in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Where does the Bible say that just being male makes you smarter? Or that being female makes you smart, for that matter. Right. There, there is nothing in there that says that there's a proclivity towards more smartness, one direction or another, right? Or that the reason why God told man that he wants man to work is because women are incompetent. Where did you run into that? Could you run a home and be incompetent? <laughs> you know what I mean? But these are the kind of things that they said. They believed this. They really believed it. The reason why... Um, um, uh, um, Oh, I don't remember. There was a whole whole plethora of things, but that's where you get the whole idea of father that fathers knows that our father knows best. It's just it's a messed up idea. It's the reason why he's delegated as the head is because God said so, right? That's the reason. You don't need any other reason. Now, if you want to know more, God will reveal to you. One of the reasons we've already covered today is because it represents the Father God, right? But it's not because he's more important. I mean, is the Father God more important than the Lord Jesus Christ, or more important than the Holy Spirit? No. But do they all have different jobs? Absolutely. Right? And, and the Father God, and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, at least in regards to this creation, they have submissive roles to the Father. Absolutely. The scriptures are clear on that. Right? In the Godhead, you've got submission, don't you? Yeah. Amen? Now, does the Father also, in some ways, submit to the Father and the Spirit? Yes. But ultimately, the buck stops with him. Are you following? Mm -hmm. Does he does he serve them? Absolutely he does. Does he love them? Absolutely he does. Does he take their desires into account when he makes a what you would you and I would consider a law? Absolutely he does. Right? But he's still the head. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. Right? <clears throat> and so 
in the family, that's the reason why. It's not, but, but see, it's because we, it's when we superimpose these certain things. That's the reason why women saw it as a challenge when they went into the workforce, which is another problem. When they left the, now I'm not talking about working, I'm talking about leaving the home to work. Right. Are you following? There's a big difference. Huge difference. Read Proverbs 31. That woman worked. Are you following me? She was industrious. She didn't let any dust or, uh, you know, uh, develop on anything and no grass grow under her feet. She was an industrious woman. Amen? It, that included, she, the, uh, the scriptures are clear that she, she bought and she sold. She, she made clothes, not only for her family, but also to sell. She, uh, she invested in certain things like purple and fine, dye, uh, fine dyes and stuff like that that enabled her, her to do commerce or to make things that were finer, that would write, write, get a higher price in order to help with the family, right? There was nothing wrong with that, but she all did it from the home. Right? Because that's where her children were, and that was where her God-given authority was. Amen? You follow? But, but see, there's no, no, no wonder women felt the challenge to go out because they were told the reason why you can't work in the workforce is because you're not as talented as a man. Well, that's just stupid. But that's what we were... Do you, do you remember hearing that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, well, you know, even if a woman does do the same job, she shouldn't get paid the same because the fact that, you know, she's just not... You know, she's, well, she's not a man. Right. Well, that's just stupid. That's just stupid. If she's going to do it, she needs to be paid. Hello? Right? Mm -hmm. The question is not whether or not, again, none of these things had to do with whether a woman was able or whether a man was able. There's a lot of men that in the natural are not able to lead a family, but they were told by God, you better. Mm -hmm. So they, at that point, have to turn to the Father and say, you know what, you need to be my strength because I'm not having this. I know, I, you know, I feel completely spiritually inept. I have no idea how to lead this family in spiritual matters, but you know what? You told me I have to, so I'm going to do it. And I'm just asking you to help me because I know that probably my 12-year-old knows more about the Bible than I do. And so, I'm, but you told me to lead, so I'm going to do it. You see what I'm saying? You see, this, this, there's, there's a lot of character development in the middle of where you, where you are, God doesn't, God doesn't change. Uh, this is the, the mess up thought of, of modern society is that God, that God is practical in that he'll change to accommodate society. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? God's been around long before there was a planet to have a society on, and he's not motivated by your ideas. He said what is right and what is wrong, and if you choose not to live within the confines of what he says, there are consequences, and we're living with them right now in mass. Isn't it true? Mm -hmm. So, so, and what the church has done in the past is that well, then we'll just kind of, we'll just kind of alter our position on a few things, not really change as much as just kind of, eh, we'll just round off the rough edges, and 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 and, and that'll make us fit in society, and, and people won't think that we're being so rough. Well, you know, the Bible told me that you know that the world's going to hate me. So why are you trying to make them like you? Yeah, that's right. Jesus said, you know, they hated me before they hated you. And, you know, and if you hold on to my words, they're going to hate you too. Right. But what do we do? We kind of alter his words a little bit so that we become more socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. and, and what do we wind up doing as a result? We begin to get the world inside of our churches. Yeah. Anybody's welcome here. Well, no, 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 I'm sorry. That's not what the scripture says. You don't invite wolves into the sheepfold. Right. Believers belong inside of the church, not non-believers. That's not... A church is not where people get born again. People get born again as they run into Christians out in the highways and the byways, not inside of a sheepfold. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's, it's by changing what Scripture says and morphing it and adapting it that that's the reason why it was. You realize it's really not that long, far of a walk from becoming seeker friendly in a church to performing gay marriages in a church being okay. It's not that big of a difference. Because you had to, what you have to do is you have to compromise the word of God to do the first thing. And how many people realize as soon as you begin to give a little bit, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot easier to give a lot later. You, say, you know what I mean? I mean, an example of this, and we've seen it in here. I've done it. Uh, well, actually, I didn't. I, I can't say I did it. Because I, but I didn't do it for the right reasons. I did it because I was bullheaded. Um, but, um, but I did. The, I was a great example of, Ameri of early America doing the right thing for the wrong reason or the wrong way. Um, in my jobs, how many times have you seen, either in your own life or in the life of others, where if you give a job an inch, they will take a mile? Right. Now, you go into the job and say, you know what, I'm not going to work on Sunday, I'm not going to work on Wednesday. That belongs to the Lord. And 
the, and all it takes is one phone call. I'll never ask you again, I promise, but we had this problem, we had that problem, this person's sick, this person can't come in, could you please come in? And all of a sudden, the enemy just comes and whispers in your ear and says, you know, a good Christian would just come in there and help them. You're not being a good witness. All right, I'll come in. And what do you find? What do you find? Next week, you're on the schedule for Wednesday. Exactly. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, I'm going to yeah. talk about. Do you know what I mean? Me I mean, now, now, I never let that happen to me. Every job I went to, I told me, you know what? I do not work on Sundays, and I do not work on Wednesdays. Period. I had a lady uh, come to me. Uh, one of my bosses call um, and say, you know, we don't have anybody to work. I've got to have you come and take care of the deli. And I said, I'm sorry. And she said, she said, no, you don't understand. You have to come. And I said, no, I don't. I'm not coming in. I said, you need to understand. And I, 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 the next day I came in and I talked to her. And I looked her dead in the eye and I said, you need to understand. If this burn building was burning to the ground on Sunday, I would come all the earlier on Monday morning and help you out. But I will not be here on Sunday. <laughs> you need to understand. Right. She never asked me again. <laughs> it, was <laughs> it was done. It was done. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, 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 they... But see, if I had given that one concession, they would have walked freaking all over me. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't give in. You just say, you know what? This is the way it is. Period. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is the, Lord, is the Lord's day. Do no work on my holy day. He did say that, did he not? Mm -hmm. So I don't do it. Now, 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 it'd be different. Now, I did tell them. I said, you know, if you need, some, if you need me to come in there, I did tell them this. If you need me to come, come in after church and help you, I'll help you, but I can't clock on. Because the scripture says, I am to do, be, not be gainfully employed on the holy day. So I'll help you, but I can't clock on. Well, we can't have you do that because our insurance won't cover you. Well, then I'm sorry, I can't come in. Now, I'm, Jesus is my witness. That is exactly word for word what I told them. I will come in, I'll help you after church. Because the Bible says, if someone if, if someone's ox falls into a ditch, are you not willing, would you not help them out on the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. But, but but do you exploit your brother and say, now pay me for getting it out of the ditch? No. <laughs> so as a Christian, would I be willing to go in there and help them after I worship? Sure, but I can't accept payment. Well, now they're not willing to have you come in. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? What is, see, what, what is the enemy going to do? He's always going to push you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and all it takes is a little bit of compromise, and you know it's just going to own you. Wow. I, I don't know how many people that, I mean, that, that happens all the time. I mean, it tried to happen to me on I think three different jobs that I had, uh, where I was actually gained, actually employed by someone. They had uh, it happened when I was working for FLR making paint, and then Sherwin Williams came in and purchased it, and they brought us all into the the office and they said, "Now you need to be working on on um, uh, you can't go home on half a day on Wednesday because I was a youth pastor. I had to leave and, and be youth, and um, we may need you to come in on the on the weekends as well." And I said, "No, no, no, sorry, that's not going to happen." And the woman, she said, well, you don't understand, you know, the, the business doesn't, no longer belongs to the Carosos, it belongs to Sherwood Williams, and this is the way we do business. I said, you hired me under the conditions that I signed up with, with the Carosos, and I will continue with that agreement. But I will not come in here on Saturdays or Sundays, and I'm not coming in on Wednesdays. Saturday, just because I don't want to, Sunday, because I won't come in, and Wednesday, <laughs> because of the fact that after a certain time, my job is to go and be a youth pastor, period. Now, I said, you know, if you want to press that, that's fine, but all I need to do is just make a phone call to the, um, the Equal Opportunity Employment Act or just call the Better Business Bureau, and this conversation will end. And she never said another word to me. All of a sudden, it was fine that I didn't work on Sunday. Are you following me? Right. But, you know, but the enemy's going to push. He's mm -hmm. going to push. He's going to push. He's going to push. Because we, we cave real easy. <laughs> Christians typically are pushovers. You know what I mean? Right. And we don't need to be that way. We don't need to be nasty either. Like I said, I did tell the one person, if you need me to come in after church, I'll help you, but you can't pay me. That showed love, and I'd have done it. I would have done it. Absolutely I'd have done it. But they were unwilling to do that because, now, because they got laws. And I understand that. They can't have you on the property doing work without being covered. I get that. But I'm willing to do it. You need to understand that. But, you know, so it still communicated love and also communicated principles. I want you to see that at the end of my employment in both of those places, every single one of those people came to me and told me how much they respected me. If I had given in, they wouldn't have respected me. Right. They respected me because I held on to my principles. Right. You know what I mean? Even though I might wind up losing my job. You see what I'm saying? Right. That's all it takes. 
That's all it takes. Now, like I said, I, I, I'm also telling the bad side of it. I, in my, even though I was willing to come in and help them, I definitely had an attitude when I dealt with it. So I was wrong in the way I dealt with it. You know, if this whole thing happened again today, it would have come out with a different attitude in Mark. So I might have done the right thing, but I did it with the wrong attitude. You know what I'm saying? Which isn't a whole lot of better than doing the wrong thing with the right attitude. You know what I mean? Either way, you're doing it wrong. But, um, but uh, you see what I'm saying. But uh, it's, it's a good thing to do the right thing always, right? Mm, right. Okay, so um, our, the wrong number five. Are all good? Oh, we did that. Okay. Uh, yes? Uh, I wrote something down in four. Yeah. But I was getting to get there. Uh -huh. uh, and it's also, you mentioned it, um, working outside of the women, working outside mm -hmm. of the home. But um, it's that attitude that we saw, and I can remember it as a child, growing up in a southern town where affluence meant godliness. Yeah. It meant that you were doing everything right and you mm -hmm. were being blessed by God and there mm -hmm. was a, a risk, you know, and a disdain to people who were just plain people. Yeah. You know, they weren't after this thing. And, uh, and another thing, uh, it's affected our children. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, it, it, just more things. Let's just get them more stuff and, and let's let everything teach them, you yeah. know, computers and iPhones, and let's let all this stuff be available, available mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And it, it's deteriorating. It's deteriorating our society. I'm going to skip forward to one last one to end on, and I'm really not going to spend a lot of time with it, I, but I really felt like the Lord wanted me to make sure that we got this one in, so we're going to do this one, okay? Um, and number nine. What exactly does the Bible say about the topics in the bulleted list above? More unmarried couples raising children. Um, this one and the one where it says more people living together without getting married. Both of those are, in, in all honesty, as best as I can see in Scripture, is a little iffy. Because the, the requirement to go through a wedding ceremony doesn't exist in the scripture. It doesn't exist. I said it didn't exist. The whole, the whole idea of having to go through a wedding ceremony didn't exist in scripture. I'm not saying that they didn't have wedding ceremonies, but there's nothing in scripture that says that in order to be joined together by God, you have to go through a ceremony. It doesn't exist in scripture. A lot. Yeah, he was there. He was part of the. He, yeah, he's part. That was something that the society had developed. In fact, because if you go back to the Hebrew, back to the um, to the Old Testament, there are no prescribed by God wedding ceremonies. They didn't exist. So the the wedding uh, the wedding thing that Jesus was part of clearly shows God's not against them, but it doesn't require them. You know what I'm saying? Jesus was in with the festivities and enjoyed the wedding as much as anybody else were there. I personally don't like weddings. I just I don't care for them. I, there's nothing about weddings I like. I don't like funerals, I don't like weddings. If I never went to another one for the rest of my life, I would be happy as a peach. I just, I don't like them. Um, but, but, you know, Jesus enjoyed it, and he went, and he had a good time, and that <laughs> clearly shows God's not against it, but he didn't require it. What he required is, if two people decide to join together, that they stay together, period, and they don't see it as an option to leave. Are you follow? Period. Now, are there mitigating things that can happen that make it okay scripturally to leave? Yes, if a believer is married to a non-believer and the non-believer chooses they don't want to live with them anymore, the believer is free, and they're free to remarry. The scripture says it, right? If you're dealing with a situation where one of the one of the two lives in habitual, I don't mean committed one act, but I mean lives in unrepented habitual adultery, you are free to divorce and remarry. The scripture says so, right? But if they just don't cook the way you like, or we just fell out of emotional love and that's the grounds for divorce, sorry, no, you're stuck. Scripture says you're stuck. You're married. Period. Now, if a woman is being abused by a man, the scripture does not say that she can divorce, but she can separate. God does not expect a woman to stay in an abusive situation. It says, I it was Paul's command that, you know, I don't want divorce is not acceptable in that case, but separation is. Get away from it. Absolutely. But you need to also understand from Jewish understanding, from the, what the scriptures would have told them to do, is she needs to leave them and go back to her father. Mm -hmm. Or to some other male in their family that would have been a benefactor and watched out for her. Yes, sir. What about that in verse 19? And the man was being abused by the wife. Probably separate. Well, no, actually, no, it's not. If you were to read in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, 
it says that uh, the woman can separate from the husband. It says, but a man shall never leave his wife. So no, mm -hmm. that's not acceptable. Yes, so, I'm sorry, what? Yes, you're being abused. Pretty much, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But you know, there again, you also have to understand that uh, um, God expects certain things out of men, including, you know, being a man. You know, so uh, if 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 you're if you're mamby pamby enough that your wife can walk on you, then there's a problem, and it's not just the wife; <laughs> it's the man. You know, rise up and put your big boy pants on and deal with it, right? You know, so. Uh, but yeah, but that, that, but you're right. I'm glad you brought that up because the scripture is pretty clear on that point, and most people don't even see that. So it's an excellent point. Um, what about the, the the other two I wanted to look at real quickly was uh, more single uh, more single women having children without a male partner to help raise them. Um, you can look it up in in Malachi chapter two. It talks about um, how God desires that there be a man present, absolutely. And the last one, of course, being um, gay and lesbian couples raising children. Um, I want us to read this one passage, and that's where we're going to end, okay? It's in Romans, the first chapter. And I was actually on a forum yesterday that began to illustrate this very thing. I could already see it. As the, the scripture just began to rise up in my heart because I could see it happening, unfolding on the page. It was a forum where a gentleman had made a statement about what was going on with the, the gay rights in, in our nation, and how that it was really the first, the beginning of the end of religious freedom in our nation, which it really is. Um, it's not an isolated issue. What verse is it? I'm sorry? Um, I'll tell you in a second when I get there, honey. But it's in Romans' first chapter. And there were a number of homosexual people that came into there and were, of course, you know, lambasting them and telling them, you know, you, you, you're just this and you're just that and all that. And he says, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm not. It's just the beginning of religious freedom being ended in our nation. And he began to just show a couple of examples around the world where this, began, where this same law that was just passed was passed over there, like over there in England. And right now, there is, there's a gay couple over there in, in the UK that is suing um, um, the, the state and a church to force the church to marry them. And they're winning. Because they gave up religious freedom when they accepted the idea of homosexuality being acceptable. And, that's, and, and across the board, you look around the planet, wherever this is, that happened, and it's happened in 20 other countries before it happened here. And in every one of them, they're having the same problem. And you know the problem is, none of us learn from it. We're too stupid to learn. Religious freedom, as a result of that being enacted in all of those countries, has begun a problem, begin, begin, begin to um, come into question. The religious freedom are now being superseded by the individual's right. They just got here where they just uh, did it here just recently. You're right. So it's, it's a dangerous thing. But look at what it says here in Romans, the first chapter. And again, this is where we're going to end because I wanted to be the, you guys to be the eat. So, um, it says here, in verse, starting in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, because God himself showed it to them. For since the creation of this world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his own eternal power and Godhead, so that every person is without an excuse. Because before they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. Well, this generation is the most unthankful generation I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Look at what the issue really is to God. They corrupted his image. Yeah. Do you, do you yeah. see how we brought that up early on today? Yeah. And you see, that's the real issue to God here. What verse did you stop at? That was in verse 23. 23. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man. Right? right. Birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Well, God did that probably about 100 years ago in America. Turn this over for that purpose. To do what? What did he say? He said, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. We've been pretty good at that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. We've been doing that for quite some time. Who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worshipped and served the creature rather than cre the creator who was blessed forevermore. 
For this reason, God gave them over to vile passions. For even, now, listen to what God calls this. He calls it vile. He said, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust towards one another. Men working sexually with men, committing what was shameful, and receiving inside of their body the penalty of their error. Isn't that what God said? Mm -hmm. Well, what did he say? It's the result of him turning them over to uncleanness because they didn't choose to worship him. Though they knew him, they choose not to worship him and glorify him as God. So we turn them over to file to their vile passions, to work things that are going to destroy them. That's where we are. We're in phase two. We're about to hit phase three. If you want to know where the culture is heading, read it right here. It's right here. <clears throat> it says right here, Likewise, the, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in their bodies the penalty of their error, which is exactly what they deserve. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God further gave them over to a debased mind. The word debased mind means a mind that lacks the ability to discern between right and wrong. They don't even see a difference anymore. That's exactly where our culture is. It says here, turn them over to a debased mind. Um, let me, where was I? I'm sorry. 28. 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting, being filled with all ungodliness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They, um, they were whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to their own parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice these things are worthy of death, not only do them, but also approve of those who do it. That's what you just saw happening. We approved it, didn't we? So are we, is, there, are we, is, it, is it any wonder that we are where we are? <laughs> you know, this was written, do you realize that it was written 2,000 years ago and you can literally think that someone wrote that about our society right. having watched it? Yes. You know what I mean? It's that accurate. And you know, but the truth of the matter is, it's the same thing happening on the 20 other continents. Because yeah. when you begin it, it goes on a road that leads a certain direction. And you saw the, the direction that that led, right? Mm -hmm. And as each thing began to unfold in order is how it's happened. And it's still happening. Mm -hmm. and, and, and why did we not, in the Supreme Court, look at the result of this being done in other nations so that we might make an informed decision about what we're doing here? Because right. they suppressed the truth and are not. They're not worried about it. They deliberately did it. They are, it's not that they don't know. They suppressed the truth, which is exactly what that verse says. They always suppress the truth. They suppress the truth because they don't want it to be known. And what's going to be the end of the result of it? Well, we're going to see. But, but anyway, so that's just an example of family values being distorted and the impact that it has because, again, it winds up, again, the reason why it ought to upset a Christian is not at the sinners specifically. It's because it's a distortion of the face of God. That's why it ought to bother the Christians. We ought to love those people, absolutely stinking loser, and offer them the, the opportunity to come into relationship with Christ. But that requires that they, you call sin, sin. Mm -hmm. If you really love them, you won't let them continue to do that without knowing that it's wrong. You need to say it. Mm -hmm. You need to say it. Right? right? I mean, that's one of the reasons why the world hated Jesus, is because he called his faith his faith. Right. If he ran to a homosexual, he would say, you know what, I love you, but you're sinning. Right. And if you don't change, you're going to split hell wide open. Right? But you know what? There's mercy with the Most High, and he will forgive. That's what he would tell them. He did it over and over again, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And yet, you know what? Uh, what the church winds up doing is they wind up changing the morality of the culture. You had something we have got to Yeah, that's why it's, it's really so important that we clean up our own lives. Absolutely. Because how can we tell someone they're sinning? I mean, no, quicker than you can get those words out, they're going to turn around and point something out at you. And they're probably right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, some, that's another, I would love to spend some time, maybe we might, I don't know what the, what the Lord tells me to do, because I'd like to talk a little bit about that, because um, the truth of the matter is, you know, I think that some of the debate that has gone on, I think that, uh, that the right has been wrong as well in some areas, 
Because, you know, I, try as I might, I can't imagine someone coming to Paul and saying, I need a tent being made. And he says, well, you're a habitual liar, so I won't make you a tent. I, I just can't see him doing that. So why do we assume that he would have done it if they were homosexual? You know what I'm saying? Now, now, does, now that's entirely different. Rendering a service like that is entirely different than putting your stamp behind it and marrying the people. That's wrong. Period. Because then they're asking you to not only endorse their sin, but to be a participant in it. That's different. Yes. But making the people a cake, if they want a cake, make them a damn cake. I mean, how many sinners do you probably serve a day anyway? You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I think we were fighting things that didn't need to be fought. Are you understanding? Mm -hmm. I, I, I try as I might, I can't see uh, um, the Apostle Paul saying, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, I, you're a prostitute. No, I'm not going to help you out. I just don't see that. That's not what I read. Now, would he have confronted her in her sin, given the opportunity to change? Yes. But if they wanted to buy a tent, sure, buy a tent. Jesus and the woman at the well. Yes. So, you know, so I, I think that some of the battles that we fight are kind of dumb. You know, not really informed. On the other hand, other battles we shouldn't give ground on. Are you following me? Okay.